everyone, I'd like to call the February 14th meeting of the Dartmouth School Committee to order. Um, will you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone to just please uh, check that their cell phones are turned on to silent mode. Um, this meeting will be rebroadcast on DCTV channels 9 in the following days, Wednesday and Thursday at 5, Friday at 6 a.m., Saturday at 8 a.m. and Sunday at 2 p.m. The meeting will be rebroadcast on DCTV channel 18 on Monday and Saturday at 12 p.m. and Thursday at 3 p.m. Uh, Ms. Genther, can we have a roll call, please? Shannon Jenkins? Yes. Mary Waite? Yes. Kathleen Amaral? Yes. John Noons? Yep. Chris Oliver? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the first item on our agenda for the evening is public comment. If anyone would like to make a comment on any of the items that are on our agenda, I would ask you to please step up to the podium, state your name, and briefly share your comments so that everyone has a chance to share their thoughts. Hello, my name is Lynn Turner, and I am speaking to the item on the agenda that is listed under old business, and it's called face coverings, and it has the word vote next to it. Um, I first want to say I'm very grateful to Governor Baker. After consulting public health officials and, um, and considering that kids are very low risk for serious illness from COVID-19, and considering their mental health from being in masks for two years for six plus six or more hours or six hours a day um, for school school days for two years and the low covid count in massachusetts and uh, uh, for the number of our states we have a low covid count uh, we're on a steep decline for covid and even in the hospital beds uh, we're at pre-pandemic levels um, in many hospitals. Uh, his decision to lift the mask mandate, I think, is a sound one. I applaud our superintendent for quickly trying to react to the celebratory news for Massachusetts and how well we are doing facing this pandemic. Uh, it's time to give our kids a sense of normalcy. They've earned it. Uh, even Jeff Riley, the state education commissioner, said it will make uh, it easier for the students to learn. And our own, uh, and uh, let's see, I, I know that many will still be wearing masks, which is great, and it should be by choice. Uh, the mandate should be lifted. That is my very strong opinion and I think it is a sound one and I think many think it is sound. So I urge our school board to please support this um, ruling by Governor Baker. Um, I hope that we can instead support, uh, that we focus on creating a supportive environment that respects everyone's choice of what is best for them. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to provide public comment? Please step up to the podium and state your name. Good evening. Uh, my name is Pedro Castanera. I am a member of the community here in Dartmouth. I have two school aged children in the school uh, system here, and I'm also a uh, product of the Dartmouth school system. I'd like to strongly uh, reinforce what was just said that uh, I also agree that it's long, been long enough. Two years of masking, forced masking of our children is uh, more than enough. Uh, if they want to wear them by choice, that's fine. But if they shouldn't and if their parents and their families choose that that's not appropriate or necessary, uh, I don't think anybody else should have the right to tell them to do it. Um, I'd appreciate that the school committee today uh, take the information that Desi provided and move forward with the 28th of February as the date to unmask our children. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to provide comment, please step to the podium, state your name, and share your thoughts. Mm 
Hi, good evening, thank you. My name is Jeannie Tripp and I no longer have any children in Dartmouth schools. I am a product of Dartmouth schools. I've lived here since I was seven years old. I have three children who graduated Dartmouth schools. I know the dedication and the love that this community showed my children. I only wanna reiterate what Lynn said and um, the previous speaker as well that I firmly believe that we as parents should be making those children, the choices for our children. And if the governor and Desi is going along with it, then everybody should be. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make comments, please step up to the podium and state their name. My name is Dan Turner, and I am a parent of two children here at the Dartmouth School Systems. And uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, have public opinion on this matter. Um, the children have been going on f now for two years with the, uh, the lockdowns, the mandates on the masks. And uh, there's plenty of evidence now that uh, state that we are really getting to the point where we should be returning to normalcy. There are countries around the world that are actually lifting all the mandates, states in this country as well. Uh, there's evidence that is uh, now out that proves the fact that these masks do a lot more harm than good. Um, as far as cloth masks, uh, the virus can travel right through it. It doesn't really prevent the spread. If, if it does, it's a very low percentage. So I implore you today to make the right decision, an educated decision, to lift the mask mandate and return our children back to a state of normalcy within the Dartmouth public school system. Thank you. Thank you. If there's other comment, please step up to the podium, state your name. Good evening, my name is Adam Herrera. I have three children in the Dartmouth school system. And just to piggyback on what the previous speaker has said, um, I just wanna reinforce and say that it is very harmful to kids. As a gas detection specialist, I detect harmful gases every day. And I've measured the levels of CO2 under the, under the masks and they reach over 30,000 ppm, which is very hazardous. And I just also wanted to ask if there's gonna be support for kids that are having difficulty after the masks come off. Um, as far as mental health, suicide rates are up for kids. Depression, anxiety is skyrocketed. And I just hope that there is programs and the nurses are looking out for these you know, um, signs of uh, suicide and depression. That is all, thank you. Thank you. If anyone else would like to make a comment, please step up to the podium, state your name, share your thoughts briefly. Hi, my name is Ken Raposa. I'll try to be beef, so much to say. So we moved here from Brazil a few years ago. My daughter is a school choice kid. We are from Westport. She was very happy freshman and sophomore year here, on top of her class. In junior year, with at home and then hybrid learning, she crashed. She has been rejected from every A-list college she has applied to so far. We have all heard about the mental health toll this has taken on kids. My daughter had the crisis center called in to help her last month. And will now miss a day of school per week for inpatient group therapy. Why? Because the eight hours of COVID this and COVID that and vaccine this and vaccine that has driven her nuts. She's not alone. Last week, the governor and Desi said, schools in the state can go mask optional. The school has always followed Desi. The superintendent has also agreed with that call. 
For two years, students like my daughter have done what the school board and the teachers unions have asked of them. Now it is time for the school board and the teachers turn to do what the students want. And by the way, have you ever polled to see what they wanted? Because I don't think you ever have. The Boston Globe and the Boston Herald polled local parents about masking and at least 80% in Boston said it was time to go, Boston. If Tessie's rules were fine before, they should be fine now. But let's just call it a truce, follow what Bonnie Gifford had said, the students will be happy, and anyone who is still worried can still wear a mask. It's a win-win. Thank you. Anybody else would like to make comment, please step up to the podium, state your name, share your thoughts briefly. Hello, my name is Nicholas Pike. I have uh, two twin boys that are gonna be entering the school system next September. They follow the EEC guidelines through their local daycare in Dartmouth that they're attending now, which states that when they turn five next month, they'll be required to wear a mask eight hours a day. I don't think it's right for my children to have spent the past four years unmasked and now be forced to wear a mask. I also don't feel it's right that children of that age should be forced to wear a mask at all for eight hours a day. This should be our choice as our parents of our children, and I think it's time for the mask policy to go. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few more minutes for public comment. If anyone would like to step to the podium and share their thoughts, please do so now. Hi, Elizabeth Neno, a school teacher in the Dartmouth system. I see 398 students, and I believe that masks are keeping us safe. As a teacher who sees that many children every week, please keep us safe. Thank you. All right, seeing no other uh, takers on public comment. Right, All right, please step up to the podium, state your name. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. My name is Stacy Martin. I have two boys in the school system. I also work in the vocational school nearby, Greater New Bedford Volk. I work hand in hand with them and the nurses work tirelessly through this. The masks, in my opinion, they don't work. We have a positive case, maybe rate of one or two kids per week. They're not transmitting it in school. They're having sleepovers, they're doing sporting events. How can you prove that this is happening in schools and you're punishing them and letting them sit in masks for hours. They don't have a normal life. They have it, depression, anxiety. This is wrong, it's child abuse. Please end it. Thank you. All right, so it's now 6.45. So unless there's anyone who else who wants to make one last brief comment, we're gonna move on to the next item on our agenda. Uh, seeing none, next we're going to move on to the approval of the minutes. I'll entertain a motion to approve the regular uh, session minutes from January 24th, 2022. So moved, Madam Chair. Second. Second. All right, so I have a motion by Mr. Oliver, a second by Ms. Wade. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? So that passes unanimously. Uh, next, I'll entertain a motion to approve the executive session minutes of January 24th, 2022. So move, Madam Chair, with the stipulation that they be held until the matter for which they were intended is complete. Second. All right, so we have a motion by Mr. Nunes, a second by Ms. Waite. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next on our agenda, we have our student representative report. Uh, senior Evan Garcia is going to update um, the committee on the goings-on at Dartmouth High. Good. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins, and happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Um, since our last meeting, a lot has been happening here at Dartmouth High School. Our winter track team competed in the SEC 
Conference Championship last Wednesday. Both the boys and the girls teams took second place, while senior athlete James Martin broke the school record for the 55 meter with a time of 6.78 seconds. This is a great accomplishment, so congratulations to James. Dartmouth High School is celebrating Black History Month all month long. Ms. Fontes Callahan and student Kaysen Chavez have created an interactive bulletin board featuring prominent African-American actors, activists, <coughs> civic leaders, poets, and musicians with QR codes that can be scanned to reveal biographical information. The Multicultural Club will be holding a PACE event showcasing the works of prominent African-American poets, writers, and orators, and it has also been working on producing weekly morning announcements focusing on the importance of Black History Month. <laughs> AP Research is one of Dartmouth High's newest and most unique courses, and it is part of the College Board's Capstone Diploma Program. Students in this course are currently collecting data for their research, and their classmates are encouraged to help take surveys and even participate in some of their experiments. Dartmouth High School will be administering course selection for the 2022 to 2023 school year over the next few weeks. Students will meet with their advisors and attend assemblies uh, facilitated by DHS's guidance department. Our program of studies was shared with all parents in Principal Thibault's weekly community update last Friday. Thank you, and that concludes my update for this meeting. Thanks, Evan. Does anyone on the committee have any questions or comments for Evan? What going on? Yeah, just thank you very much, Evan, for your report as oh. usual. Well, thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you, Evan. And you, you Evan. are welcome to go, which that's good. You're on your way out. Thank you. Have a good evening. I know you're busy. All right, so the next item on our, uh, uh, that's up is our consent agenda. We have a number of items under here. We have the DECA State Career Development Conference and Competition, the Indoor Percussion Dance Team, WGI East Power Regional, the Varsity Color, Color Guard, WGI East Power Regional, Indoor Winds, WGI East Power Regional, Indoor Color Guard, WGI World Championships, Indoor Percussion Dance Team, WGI World Finals, and Indoor Winds, WGI World Finals. I read those all because I think we can probably consider them all together unless anyone wants to uh, speak about any one of those. So I will entertain a, a motion to approve all of those requests that I just read off there. So moved. Second. All right, so I have a motion by Mr. Noons and a second by Ms. Waite. Any discussion? I would just uh, wish all them all Thank best you. of luck. Yeah, so exciting. It's, and it's just to good, to, it's good to see the, the students for DECA back in yeah. Boston yeah. in person. That's, oh, that's yeah. a great time. Mm -hmm. My daughter's excited. I, yeah. I was telling Dr. Gifford a funny story that um, the students were a little worried that the school committee had to vote and we wouldn't approve it. And I said, it's okay. That's just how we do it every year. It's a normal matter of business. Yeah, just, Don't worry about it. We're all very excited. I'm pretty confident that, <laughs> that we're good with that. So Good luck. Yeah, they were, they were nervous because I think they're excited to be going. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't blame them. All right. So any, hearing no further discussion, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Oppose? Those carry unanimously. All right. Next on our agenda um, is our spotlight on kids, Potter Elementary School. I'll hand it over to Dr. Gifford for the introduction. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. We're very happy to have Mr. Porter and Ms. McHenry here with I don't know how many people they have back there, but <laughs> leave it to Mr. Porter to get a big old group on a frigid night to present um, what's going on at Potter. So. Well, it's Valentine's yeah. Day, and of course they want to be with me, right? <laughs> Where else do they want to be? Nice Happy Valentine's Day. I like the red, thank yes. you, yeah. thank you, thank you very much. So good evening, and we are pleased to bring you Potter School's Spotlight on Kids. As I believe many of you know, Potter School has three big beliefs that guide us every day. They are pause to be kind, pause to be safe, and pause to be a learner. In the past, we have shared with you how our students are engaged in creating a kind culture at Potter School. Tonight, our presentation is going to focus on pause to be a learner, with an integrated focus on how we learn to be safe. We are firm believers that it takes a village to help educate a child. So tonight, we have brought some members of our village to demonstrate to you some of the learning that happens at Potter School. As we go through this presentation, you will see that learning in school is not the learning of previous generations. It involves technology, differentiation, teaching beyond the school day, teaching kids to be safe, and incorporating the arts. By offering children an integrated experience, we take to heart, we take to heart the words that are found in this quote. Our job as educators is not to prepare kids for something. Our job is to help kids learn to prepare themselves for anything. So tonight, you will hear from our math coach, Dana Doucette, one of our special education teachers, Michelle Dias, 
Grade one teacher, Kristen Martino, who is currently coordinating the district's after school program at Potter School. Social workers, Paul Schwenard and Carrie Gregoire. And visual arts instructor, Beth Netto. Also, we would like to extend a huge thank you to our instructional technology specialist, Sandy Chicka. She really is the executive producer, director <laughs> of this event. And she's bringing this presentation together through the power of video. Following our presentation, we have one brief appreciation that, we will that will highlight the work of a special group of adults who make a huge difference in the lives of our students. Now, before we begin, I do want to let you know that some of the pictures in the video were collected from before the pandemic began, so you may see a few children who are indoors without a mask. So, we're ready to begin, and first up, Mrs. Doucette. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Good evening, and thank you for having uh, us here this evening, um, giving us the opportunity to share some of the learning that's happening up on Cross Road. Um, a few weeks ago, my colleagues over at DeMello School gave you a thorough look into our new math program, Bridges. But I'm here to share an extension of our math learning known as ST Math. And the ST stands for Spatial Temporal, because ST Math consists of highly engaging puzzles presented visually without the use of language, numbers, or symbols. The founder of this program, Matthew Peterson, struggled with traditional language-based instruction due to dyslexia. So he created a different approach to mathematics. Gigi the Penguin is the mascot for ST Math. And by answering a puzzle correctly, Gigi will happily cross from one side of the screen to the other. If an error is made, Gigi will bump into an obstacle and retreat back, and the student will have to try again. So the first video clip you will see is a first grader working through a puzzle. The second video clip will be a first grade class checking their progress and moving their little GGs on a stick toward their 100% completion. Students feel empowered <coughs> when they can track their own learning. Alina, what do you have to do in this puzzle? Um, you have to make the same amount. Same amount of what? Um, both. Oh. And what happens when you get the same amount? Can you show me? What were you doing when you were touching all of them? Holding. Oh. He made it across the bridge. Between those two, which one do you go to? What is 24, 25? That's your pocket. Nice job. 20%, yep. Congratulations, you moved. All right. Whoa, what's your number? 31%. Oh my gosh. Here's Gigi. Which pocket are you going to? Look at your numbers. That's the one. You jumped the whole pocket. Congratulations. Radar, you looked excited in the room. Where are we going? <gasps> what are you on? 37. 37%, my man. Which pocket's yours? 
So look at the numbers. That's the one. Nice job. Up top. Woo! that will be starting after the February break. Um, and it was inspired by one of our fifth grade teachers, Mr. Craig Dutra. It's set up as a basketball bracket, and last year Mr. Dutra did this, um, and it was um, a huge success for the children. Thank you very much. And next up is Michelle Dias, one of our special ed teachers. Hello, good evening. Um, happy Valentine's Day. Um, I've been using the Sunday system level one this year with some of my fourth and fifth grade students. Um, this program is based on Orton Gillingham, which is a well-respected reading intervention program. Many intervention programs are designed for use with individual students um, for several hour long sessions every week. And this isn't practical for a public school setting. Um, I can't work with one on one for a whole hour for very many kids at all. So, um, it's great, the author of this program, Arlene Sande, designed the program to be used with small groups in just 30 minutes for at least three to five times a week. Each part of the lesson is strictly timed and is designed to provide repetitive practice and reinforcement of skills. The program uses a multi-sensory approach, meaning students will see the word, hear the word as they say it, and feel the words as they trace it with their fingers. A placement test is be given at the beginning of the year to ascertain the level at which the, each student should start. And every third level, there's a mastery check to assess the student's proficiency in reading and spelling of the words. The students need to pass both the reading and the spelling portions in order to progress to the next level. Though the program is regimented, it also allows for fun. They have a ball toss game and other board games too that the kids really enjoy, so they like to have that. You have your marker and your eraser ready. We're going to do our spelling sounds. We can cancel this, put it back two minutes, and you can start it when we're ready. The first sound is ing. 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 The next sound is um. Um. Say it. Um. Photo, photo, photo. What's the next? Next one is ong. Say it. Ong. What's the next one? Ah. Ong. And then it's or. Say it. Or. or. Ang. Say it. Ang. Ang. Nice. Quote. Say Quote. it. Seven minutes for the next section. So the first word is sing. Say it. Sing. 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 It. Ing. And so we should be tapping it out or on ourselves or uh, finger spelling it up here. Good. I like to see Alyssa tracing it on just to make sure. Ing. Good. Next word. Paul. Say it. Hall. Oh, like I'm going down the hall. Hall. Oh, hall. Oh. Jacob, um, let's check how you, how do we spelling hall? How do you spell that all sound, Isabel? A-L-L. A-L-L. -L. Let's make, say, hall, two, right, hall two more times to just get it really into like, our... It has to be all. air. Oh, yes, all, but all. remember all. It's just all. like the word all, all. but all. it's the sound in other words as well. It, black, black. Yeah. boop, so you're sounding it out, boop, boop, ah. How do you spell that k sound after a short vowel? Alyssa? CK. Awesome. I'm going to read these words starting from the top. Sing. Sing. Yeah. Oh, all right. The bee may sting you. 
The bee may sting you. So if you say the whole sentence, the bee may sting you. Okay, no, we're not talking about it. We're just yeah. writing our sentence. It's well, a music that breaks down. The bee, the bee may sting you. Capital T. All right, we're going to just do one sentence today. I'm going to just cancel this so it doesn't make noise. Um, what's our C for capital letters? What's the capital letter, Jacob? T. T and the? Um, all the words. The B may sting you. you. One, two, three, four, five words. Yeah. Make sure you have all five words. So the punctuation. Dylan, what kind of punctuation goes at the end? Period. Period. And then with spelling, the B. How many E's at the end of this B when it's the little insect? Insect. Insect. Two. Two. Yes, the B. May. How do you spell the long A sound at the end of a word, Jacob? A. A. Y. A -Y may. St. Ing. Mm -hmm. You. Check, check, check. Mm -hmm. Have some new sight words that we're going to be adding to our list. Mm -hmm. one. one. This is the number one. Wait, like one. one. Well, that's one. Like, you no. have. One marker in your hand. You said once upon a time, and this is what once what? looks like. What? So we're. I know you know one, but so let's try once. Upon one. O n e one. Let's trace it again because not everybody. You don't have to write it. You can just trace it. O n e one. Good. Now we've got once, as in, like Jacob said, once upon a time, O N C E, once. <clears throat> and now we'll hear from our school counselors. Good evening. We are here tonight to give you a snapshot on how we teach a safety lesson to the students. It's the Alice drill, also known as the sheep, shepherd, and wolf drill, where the wolf is the dangerous intruder in the building and we must do things to ruin his day. The book we use is I'm Not Scared, I'm Prepared by Julia Cook, and it uses a kid-friendly message. The sheep are the students and the shepherd is the adult in, in charge. And the number one lesson is always follow the adult in charge. <clears throat> the slide that you're looking at here is an actual page from that book. It goes through the steps of Alice, with A meaning alert that there may be a, an intruder in the building, um, L for lockdown, I for inform, C for counter, and E for evacuate. What you're about to see is some actual slides of us practicing with the children in the classroom um, doing a lockdown. You'll see here that we have the kids moving some of the desks and furniture up around the um, doors. It's intended to be proactive and to provide options in case of a real emergency such as this. And here we have C for counter. So they're holding their special something, getting ready in case the intruder comes into the room and they will throw and run. And the most important Part of the lesson is the evacuate. You'll see here that some of the kids are running out through the back door. They're waving their hands. They're trying to present um, in a chaotic way to cause confusion if there was a real intruder and to meet over at the rally points. And we pass it over to Kristen Martino, first grade teacher. Thank you, Carrie and Paul, members of the school committee, Dr. Gifford. I'm Kristen Martino, I'm a first grade teacher over at Potter, but tonight I'm here as the SAIL site coordinator. SAIL, which stands for Student Adventures in Learning, is a free after school program that's offered to elementary school students through a grant provided by DESE. Its intention is to accelerate the learning after the school hours. 
So a big thank you, shout out goes out to Desi as well as Mrs. Tracy Oliveira, who applied for and received the grant for Dartmouth. It's been my pleasure organizing this and running it as well as overseeing it in action. We just concluded session one, which was 10 sessions, five weeks long. We offered two crazy eights, one for the younger kiddos and one for the upper grades, which was math based. We offered comic books um, with children learning about superheroes, actions, speech bubbles, and that one spread from kindergarten all the way to fifth grade. Endangered species, and we did a kids who code. We're on a little hiatus right now, and then February 28th, we'll be starting up session two, where we'll see comic books again, as well as crazy eights, but we're also adding in shark attack, sports and fi fitness, and then for the younger kiddos, we're gonna have a mad science class. So here you see a couple of the classes doing different things. The children always had smiling eyes, lots of action going on. Thank you, and now I hand it over to our visual arts educator, Mrs. Beth Netto. Thank you, Kristen. Good evening, school committee, and thank you all for this opportunity to share with you the value of our visual arts program at Potter School. I get the privilege of being the art teacher to 389 amazing and unique students. Don't tell anyone, but I have the best job at Potter. <laughs> <laughs> I get to spark the creativity of these children and expand their knowledge of the visual arts all while getting to know them for six years. Each carefully crafted and thought out lesson consists of at least one of the elements of art. What are the elements of art? They are line, form, color, value, space, shape, and texture. These elements make up the standards of art from which I teach. Many of the standards that are mapped out in our Massachusetts frameworks are multifaceted and cross the curriculum. Our fifth graders get to discover one point perspective as they use rulers and lines to give the illusion that their art is three dimensional. A crowd favorite is our rubber stamp carving and printing using Native American symbols. Art is an awesome way to bridge cultures. Fourth graders have a hands on experience with informal balance. Just like math, we can balance our art formally and informally. Third grade creates radial designs that dive into repetition, symmetry, and design. In second grade, we become color experts as we create tint and shade ice cream cones. We also invent our very own colors and name them. In first grade, we explore texture as we paint like Eric Carle with combs, rollers, and sponges. Kindergarten is where it's at if you want to see the awe and wonder of art at its best. Discovering that yellow and blue make green is magical. Making rainbows using only our primary colors is quite exciting when you are five. Learning about famous artists is one of the ways that I engage students. Recently, we studied Piet Mondrian, a Dutch artist whose fame came from creating abstract art broken down into its simplest form. All the grade levels studied Mondrian and created art inspired by him. Each lesson was age appropriate. First and second graders painted a mural inspired by Mondrian and our Potter expectations. Studying famous artists is a great way to cover our standards while inspiring the next generation of art enthusiasts. Our engaging 40 minute lessons are filled with discovery weaving, printmaking, sewing, sculpting, clay, painting, oil pastels, and soft pastels are some of the materials that we explore. <laughs> the benefits of a great arts program is invaluable. Students learn problem-solving skills, critical thinking skills, as well as how to collaborate and cooperate. They learn to share, organize, express themselves, and clean up. Our preschool class, I, in our preschool class, I work closely with Mrs. Weaver to choose art lessons that are engaging, age appropriate, and aligned with her weekly themes. Our collaboration enhances her curriculum 
while building a strong foundation of arts education. At any time of the year, you will find the hallways at Potter filled with art. Murals and bulletin boards made by our Potter artists fill our school with color and excitement. Thank you for allowing me to share about some of the learning that takes place in art with you. I think the best people to share why art is important at Potter School are our students. Introducing Madison and, and Edward from Mrs. Pimentel's second grade to share a little bit about why they, what they have learned in art. What I like about art is I like seeing Miss Netto. She, um, she does great art and she teaches us a bunch of cool things. I love it, everything about her. It's awesome and I love art. My favorite artist is Pablo Picasso because he draws what he feels and he had several art styles and periods. Thank you. And next, I would like to introduce to you our fabulous assistant principal, Melissa McHenry. <coughs> Good evening. Thank you, Mrs. Doucette, Ms. Dias, Mr. Schwinnard, and Mrs. Gregoire, Mrs. Martino, and Mrs. Netto for providing the committee with some of the ways our students pause to be a learner at the Potter School. Pausing to be a learner at Potter, particularly during a pandemic, has been sustained and supported by our amazing teacher assistants. Our teacher assistants work closely with our classroom teachers and staff in a variety of ways. Well, during a pandemic, it might have also included covering multiple recesses, covering multiple lunch duties, arrival and dismissal duties, it may have meant taking over for a classroom teacher during a period of quarantine while trying to learn their, all about their Google Classroom in a matter of minutes. It could also be acting as a building-based substitute where they were teaching PE one minute and music the next. It might also be supporting our school nurse, Paula Lassie, with our test and stay program. In most cases, our teacher assistants would be hearing about this the morning of or sometimes minutes before we needed their help. Potter School has always been fortunate to, to have such dedicated and professional teacher assistants who work hard each and every day. But most importantly, they create positive and caring relationships daily with our students. So to this end, we thought that tonight, it was <coughs> only right to give them a special shout out this evening and thank them using the words of the students whose lives they touch every day. Mrs. Moran helps us with our reading, writing, and some reading group some days. Mrs. G is the best because she always helps us. Mrs. G is the best because she makes our materials. Mrs. G is the best because she helps us learn. Mrs. G is the best because she's helpful, kind, pretty, and awesome. Thank you for all you do, Mrs. Goyette. Mrs. Braga was always really nice to us, and whenever we had a share or a story to tell, she would always have a very fun story to go with it. Thank you for helping us with the measurements and for the rotations and thank you for helping the teacher with the printer for getting stuff and thank you for helping me with my math when I sometimes don't really get it or I have a hard time. Mrs. Patnod is very helpful. She helps us when, with math when we're confused. She also does a great job doing Friday friendly letters. Mrs. Patnod does a great job working with Mrs. Oliver. We love when you read with us. We love when you do math with us. We love when you teach us new things. You, you make, make us shine! shine. Mr. 
Miss Jasmine helps us understand our math mistakes so that we can be smarter. I like that Mrs. Jasmine is kind and patient, which benefits the students and helps them learn better. Besides the best thing I love Mrs. B is amazing because she's kind and nice also, Mrs. B is amazing because she goes out of her way to help people. So as you just heard from some of our Potter kids, our TAs are the heroes for the entire Potter community. And tonight we have with us uh, Mrs. Botello, Mrs. Morin, and Mrs. Braga. I think they deserve a round yeah. of applause for all that they do. So we thank them on behalf of all our students. And with that, we thank you for allowing us to present tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So anybody in the, anybody in the committee have any comments, questions? Do you want to start, Mr. Oliver? Sure, I'll start, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, th first of all, thank you both for the, uh, I th thought it was a very well-rounded uh, presentation, including uh, many of the uh, subject areas and um, much of your staff and students. Um, you know, one thing that stood out for me, and I'm, I, I thank you for recognizing it, is recognizing our teaching assistants. And then not just here, obviously, uh, you have some spectacular ones here at Potter, um, but across the entire district. Because as I know from being on school committee and being an educator myself, that um, uh, teacher, teacher assistants um, during the pandemic have played a huge role um, in a huge function, um, and we really couldn't have uh, probably opened some days uh, without their without their support. Um, so, and they also provide that um, you know that familiar face a lot of the times. Uh, that whether it's as soon as the students get off the bus, um, you know, it goes a long way um, for what they do. So, um, I'd, I'd like to personally thank them as well. Um, but overall, wonderful presentation. To all, to all your staff, so thank you very much. And hey, Mr. Olive, I can just um, second that. As you said, um, we probably couldn't have opened on most days. Um, last year, um, I had COVID, and Mrs. McHenry and I share an office, so she became a close contact. <laughs> Amazingly, the school continued running. <laughs> if any one of those teacher assistants were out, um, we would have a problem. So clearly, they that's are a very the that's a fair point, Mr. Assistant. Porter. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nunes. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Porter, Ms. McHenry, thank you very much. I was making some notes, and it was just interesting to see the enthusiasm of the students, which trickles down because the teachers are enthusiastic. So mm -hmm. it's trickling down to the students and, and their enthusiasm, you know, with, uh, you know, with the reading. Uh, I'm excited. I got a kick out of the March mathness, <laughs> not madness, mathness type of deal, you know, coming up and such. And, you know, I think what was real interesting in the question that I have is I noticed uh, when the reading specialist was working with the students and it, uh, it's almost like they were writing on a whiteboard table type of deal, mm -hmm. you know, because then they could correct and, you know, so that was, you know, technology before it used to be pen and paper. So Exactly. And actually those tables um, we actually had purchased for our computer lab. Um, with COVID, we had to kind of spread things out, so we decided to give our special education teachers their own teaching space, and those tables came in handy because, as you could see, yeah. the children were able to immediately engage with their work. We also wanted to make sure you saw the Sunday system up close because you folks in your budget last year were able to <coughs> set aside a certain amount of money to be able to support that, and we wanted to let you know that we're <coughs> very excited how it's really meeting the targeted concerns of a, a small group of students, yes, but an important group. Helping everyone. It is. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, well, I just really I enjoy hearing from, you know, all the schools and hearing about what, what your teachers are doing and what you're sort of facilitating through your leadership of your buildings. Um, you know, my, my kiddos, none of my kiddos went through Potter, but we were lucky at least to, for one of my, um, my children to experience your leadership at Quinn. And uh, I just, you know, I've taken down notes and just really uh, – love always hearing about your your kind and your supportive school and the work that you do and i really appreciate this presentation but then you had me at the tas i mean <laughs> having, <laughs> having yeah. a child who uh 
relied heavily um, uh, individually for, for, for that, um, for all of his needs throughout the day and the relationships that, you know, have been built because of that and the, you know, above and beyond attitude um, and, and just the, that TAs, the teachers and teaching assistants sort of present every day and just their dedication to the students and they really are that thread, that fabric that makes everything work so well and I just, of course you did honor them in this way and I'm just so appreciative of that because, you know, nothing new, you got me emotional. So uh, I just really, uh, really, uh, you know, um, applaud everything that you do on Crossroads and um, how that kind of fi filters through as those students kind of become, uh, you know, uh, independent learners and, and really prideful around, you know, what they can contribute to their community moving on up to the middle and the high school. Um, you know, it starts, it starts at that pre-K and, and I just appreciate having you here, so thank you. Thank you. And I just also want to add, as you mentioned, that the TAs are the thread. Um, as you notice as the TAs names went up, you see that they were in, like, in kindergarten or third grade. Mm -hmm. and especially for our more anxious kids, when they start school every September, it, it's not their new teacher that they're excited to see. They don't know their new, new teacher yet. It's seeing a Mrs. Vitello, a Mrs. Morn, a Mrs. Braga, mm -hmm. who they remember from kindergarten. So it eases that fear and that anxiety. Mm -hmm. And we do go to them frequently and say, Someone that you worked with last year is having a really hard time, and they're always up for that challenge. So they're very important. Thank you. I mean, I, I have to echo everything my colleagues have said. You know, I, I, clearly you have a wonderful team, um, you know, and the fact that you're leading them and, you know, your leadership is always evident. You know, I think this uh, cohesion is, is very clear. And then again, you showcased for us, you know, a full day. You know, I think, you know, we saw, and I, and I loved, you know, hearing, you know, seeing the art, seeing it's such a vibrancy that, you know, I see within the school. I mean, I'm like anxious to walk through those hallways and see that. But again, we were able to see the curriculum as it emanated up from kindergarten the whole way through fifth grade. And then, you know, while we're doing art, we are also focusing on our students who are challenged with reading and dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And I know, again, like that for me, you know, to, to zero in on that, that attention and that, and I think as a parent, you know, we see a lot of the the fast pace highlights the fun but you know that kind of skill you know repetition and everything is such a fundamental and you know um just such an important skill to learn and and, and takes you so many places but to to go there and you know and, and see you know that work happening you know and even to see that bit of technology that's helping you know again i was very was very impressed by you know by watching that because we don't always see that again so um so thank you thank you to your staff um as always it's great so thank you thank you and we, we don't want to um minimize it has been a challenge the no, past two sure. years and obviously at many school committee meetings you folks have asked us questions how we're right. handling the pandemic but i do want to reassure people and hopefully the videos and the amazing words that the staff said tonight have shown you that Although it's been a challenge, learning is not just going on. We are succeeding right. in, in children learning. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I also enjoyed uh, the presentation, and I particularly appreciated how I think people sometimes still think that um, you know the modern school is just a teacher in a classroom. But I think you showed the range of sort of what's needed to run a modern school: a math coach, special education teachers, teaching assistants, social workers, after program. Um, because you know we're about to go into the budget and mm -hmm. sometimes i think people say well why, what do these people do like, well, they all, everyone contributes to the education of our kids and it's that team that makes the education complete and i thought that that what you showcased here really showcased that sort of that whole range of teamwork that's required to provide that education to our kids so i very much appreciated that so thank you very much thank you thank you all very much appreciate it thanks have a good thank evening All right, next on our agenda is uh, fiscal year 23 budget. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Kiley. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Thank you for relating that wonderful presentation mm -hmm. to the budget. <laughs> I thought back to follow the presentation perspective. I'm going to get the presentation up here. Okay, testing. So, um, 
John while Jonathan's getting that up I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to talk about the FY 23 budget so the budget was prepared um, starting with uh, the schools and departments and um, expanding that uh, to talk um, individually with those groups and then bring everybody together and talk about where we are with this budget process and then meet with the school committee subcommittee on budget um, to discuss the budget some more so this is sort of the next step uh, in moving forward and the first time this budget is really um, you know going to be made public it's our process is to make needs-based proposals um, that uh, were submitted back before the holidays in December um, and then discuss, evaluate, um, then discuss some more and reevaluate and try and come up with a plan. We do that in the framework, if you could back up a little, Jonathan, to the second, uh, the second slide. Thanks. Um, so we do that in the framework of the overall strategic improvement plan um, and where Jonathan has us right there uh, really looking at teaching and learning access and equity and community engagement which have been a part of our strategic plan now for for some years and continue to be our areas of focus um, and give us uh, some guidance as to how to move forward with this budget proposal these guiding priorities, I'm not going to read through them all, but um, you'll note in our proposals and our recommendations in the budget that they're very closely tied to these guiding principles. Um, that's something we try and frame each proposal in terms of uh, con consideration of, of these principles and make sure that um, our focus is, is where it needs to be in terms of allocating funding. So the overall budget uh, for FY23 proposal is $49,383,406. So what does that, how does that break down? So uh, instruction is 75% of the budget. So instruction category includes teachers, principals, teaching assistants, substitutes, um, other instructional staff, instructional technology, professional development, special education services, materials, uh, books, and other supplies. So that's 75% of our budget. That's the big green piece of the pie there. Uh, other services, which is the next largest area, is about 11% of our budget. So that's transportation, attendance, health services, um, <coughs> uh, athletics, student activities, that's 11 percent. Maintenance ut and utilities, which includes uh, things like custodial services, snow plowing, um, timely topic, um, and maintenance of the buildings and grounds, that's 8 percent of our budget. Administration, so that includes our um, district-wide administration, our administrative technology, like our student information system and other types of technology, um, legal services, that's 2% of our budget. And then uh, tuitions, so this is for students who um, we can't serve in district and have to be served uh, at out-of-district placements, that's 4% of our budget. So. Actually, none of the percentages changed um, from last year. So I just found that interesting. Although you'll see that there's pretty big increases in some of the categories. You'll see that on the next uh, slide here. So um, instruction increased $1,974,141. So a 5.6% uh, increase in that area. So that... Um, as you could imagine, most of our budget is <coughs> salaries, um, and so that is for contractual obligations, uh, provision for collective bargaining, um, and some budget recommendations that we're going to talk about in a minute. Administration uh, decreased um, relative to our restructuring of our director of teaching and learning position. Again, we'll talk about that coming up. Um, maintenance and utilities, that is for the increase there is 
three uh, percent, which was for projected um, contractual obligations and utility costs. Other services, uh, increase of 2.9 percent, uh, that is an increase for transportation costs and some contractual obligations um, and the increase in the minimum wage as well, which impacts some positions in that category. And then tuitions is, again, that's just um, services that were required to provide by IEP for certain students and um, the state increases prices every year so that it's incorporated into that. So the bottom line budget, uh, the change from last year is an increase of $2,202,857 of 4.7%. So specific recommendations that are incorporated, and you'll, you'll see some of the, on, on the next slide in a minute, some of the <coughs> things that we couldn't incorporate, but some of the things that we could incorporate, and there's not a lot on this list, unfortunately, this year, um, were the Quinn School teaching position. So really, we, we took a look at, um, we always watch enrollment uh, carefully. And we found that we had an inequity in terms of um, particular grade levels at the Quinn School and that we needed to address that. Um, so we were going to have 27 plus kids in a classroom, um, not ideal for learning. And we, so we've attempted to address that in, uh, in this budget proposal. Restructuring the Director of Teaching and Learning. Okay, so um, I, think, I think you all know that Tracy Oliver is retiring um, in September. So our proposal includes um, shifting things to have two positions, one elementary school, elementary level teaching and learning director, and one secondary level teaching and learning director. So in terms of budget-wise, what that means is um, the FY22 budget included actually the assistant <laughs> superintendent position, um, which we never filled. So we've removed the assistant superintendent position and we've split into two director of teaching and learning positions. Um, so then we've also removed grant funding that supports those positions. So the net of all that is the $136,000 increase. And that'll really allow us to target the needs more specifically and, and not be spread so thin uh, in terms of the curriculum work that needs to be done in the district. Um, so have much more focus and be able to provide a better transition from level to level um, by, by having these positions in place. And then the third and last uh, recommendation that we've included there is registered behavior technician teacher assistant position. So it's actually a little more than just that, but it is uh, to hire one RBT who um, can meet the needs of specific students that are required in their, IE in their IEPs um, and services that they certainly need. Uh, it's also identifying teacher assistants in our um, school now, current employees, who would like to be trained as RBTs, and putting them through training, providing them with, there's a contractual stipend that goes along with being a um, registered behavior technician. Um, and so it would be providing them with that and uh, having them in place so that we would have a, a, a more robust, flexible, system to provide the services that we need um, and make sure that everybody gets exact, all the students get exactly what they need in that regard. So those are the three proposals that we've incorporated into this budget proposal. This is always the sad, uh, the sad slide. So the budget request's not funded. Um, there's, there's quite a bit that's not funded. There, um, at the high school is postgraduate transition program. There are, um, throughout the schools, there are supply needs. Um, the, the middle school requested a SPED interventionist. Uh, there's behavior specialists, social workers, teacher assistants. Um, there's a, a fairly long list there. 
um, including on the list eliminating the high school student parking fee, which was the topic of the um, school committee earlier in the year. So what that would have represented was that $752,000 uh, increase and one point almost 1.6 percent we would have been uh, our overall budget request would have been 6.3 percent had we incorporated all these items I, I think it's important <coughs> to note that um, from dr. Gifford and I in in preparing the proposal have um, our thought is that we would commit some funding to support some of these things outside of the operating budget. So our proposal would, would um, use school choice funding for approximately $62,000 of cost. The, the target with the school choice funding would be to combat the inflationary costs that we've seen. Uh, most of our requests for supplies are not to buy things that we haven't bought before there to pay for things that we already buy and need and the costs are increasing and the availability is difficult and um, you know just like all of us at home the schools we you know we're, we're fighting that um, inflationary environment and um, it's been it's been difficult so our thought is that we would use again approximately sixty two thousand dollars of school choice to support those the schools in that regard and then we'd also look at um, ESSER funding, the ESSER the federal um, COVID-related grant funding, uh, to support approximately $75,000 of requests um, relating to after-school programs, programs for kids, um, and staffing that we really feel is, you know, is critical. Um, so. That is the good news, I guess, is that there are some things that aren't built into that operating budget request that we, we feel we could support and uh, be able to fit into the grant and be able to fit into the, the school choice funding for that. And basically, those are the, those are the factors um, that make up the FY23 budget proposal. So um, I know I have provided you with uh, electronic version of the backup for the budget I have in an email last week. Um, I'm be happy to provide you with a printed copy if you like. Um, save just let the me trees. know. Yeah, we can save the trees. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so the, the budget timeline, just you, vote, you voted that back in the fall, but that's included in, the, in your packet. Um, we have a number of opportunities to talk about the budget between today and, um, and moving forward. We have a projected um, public hearing on March 21st um, for the budget uh, and a vote sometime after that by the school committee. So we, we have some time to talk about, uh, talk about where we are. Um, the town part of the process, I think, is probably a little behind where they normally are, um, which I guess isn't surprising in these times, I guess. Um, so we don't have, we haven't received a whole lot of information from them as to their part of the budget process yet. Um, there are factors that we do know. We've, we've got a 1% increase on, on the table from the governor uh, in terms of Chapter 70 funding, so that's almost like a step backwards. <laughs> um, there's information included in your budget packet about, about that. Um, so that was fairly disappointing. Um, look, does look like grant funding is going to remain fairly stable. There's also information in the packet about that. So, um, you know, I'd be happy to field any questions you might have and obviously you know we have lots of lo several opportunities to talk mm -hmm. more about it along the way I'm gonna take the chair's prerogative to ask you one question then I'll open it up um, did we get our health insurance in numbers yet are we still waiting on those we don't so um, just informationally I think I shared it with the budget um, subcommittee so the town uh, the, the range given to the Maya members, that's our health insurance group, was somewhere between zero and 7.5% increase. <laughs> now, that's a pretty big range, right? But the wow. good news is that somebody's going to get that 0% increase. So I, yeah, I don't know. I, that might be us. Um, 
So last year, we were below average. So the average, they've told us, is 3.7%. Makes sense, right in the middle of those two numbers. Um, and uh, last year, we were below average. So I'm hopeful that we will be. Do you have any sense when we'll get those numbers? Uh, I think that it should be in, it should be, it might be before the next okay. school committee meeting. Right. But I'll, I'll certainly, it's unfortunately, you know, kind of out of our control. Right. Um, but that can have a big impact on where we are. I mean, it does. Zero versus 7% is oh, a big yeah. difference. Yeah, yeah. It does, for it sure. Available, the for funds sure. available. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we'll start down there, Mr. Oliver, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kiley, uh, for your presentation. Uh, just a couple of questions. I guess around the budget, because it does, uh, it does matter, how are our enrollment numbers been? Have they rebounded since, uh, my assumption is probably no, but have they rebounded since uh, pre-pandemic? Um, are we seeing more students um, still homeschooled? Are we seeing students that, um, you know, are in private? My assumption is that, you know, once the uh, mask mandate is lifted, that maybe we may see that turn around a little bit, but how, how are our enrollment numbers? Our, our enrollment is down. Considerably? Uh, it, yeah, it, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's down slightly since last year. Um, the enrollment numbers, some of the enrollment numbers are in there, and I can provide you with more uh, detail. But, you know, it, it, the enrollment is, is an issue, for sure. It is down. Um, we're fortunate from a Chapter 70 <laughs> perspective, from, from a state funding side, that we're held harmless at this point with mm -hmm. that. So that there's no decrease in state right, in funding based on that, but um, it, it's it's over time we've we've seen a decrease in the last you know 15 years gra a gradual decrease sure. in enrollment. The COVID issue um, you know was a was a pretty big one and, and still remains. Okay. So it, yeah, it, I was it, just I it was hasn't just bounced back yet. Okay. No. Um, in regards to ESSER two and ESSER three funding, where are we at with? Uh, have we completely depleted ESSER two? Um, and I know ESSER three is can be carried through what 2024, 2025. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, so how are we looking with our ESSER funds? Sure. So I can give you more information uh, for that. But what we've done so far, we're currently using ESSER two. We will not exhaust ESSER two this year. We won't. Okay. Um, so we'll be using ESSER 2 and 3 <laughs> during FY23, during this proposed budget cycle, um, and then the following budget cycle. And it's going to be a challenge, of course, as you know, Dr. Gifford and I have talked about it a lot, um, as to the staffing that we've incorporated into ESSER is fairly significant, and it's needed. It, I mean, the intent of the ESSER funds is to support student needs as a result of the pandemic. So when, in two years, when that money's gone, does that mean that there's going to be no more needs? Sure. I don't think yeah, that's, probably I don't not. Think that's probably. realistic. So right. we're going to have to find a way to either incorporate it into our budget and increases in our budget or find some other method um, because I don't think we can necessarily rely on the federal government to keep uh, sure. adding additional funding out further than this. So it's, it's a challenge for us. But we have funds for FY23 and 24. Okay. So just to confirm, we're still pulling from ESSER 2. We haven't mm -hmm. touched ESSER 3 yet? Have not spent any of ESSER 3. Okay. Yet. And no. obviously, we do have several positions that's funded through these grants, yes. as we know, um, which leads me to my next question. Overall, um, I know we proposed one um, teaching position at Quinn mm -hmm. uh, the, and the uh, uh, behavior person, uh, RBT. Mm -hmm. um, do we expect, I guess at the end of the day, are we looking at a, um, you know, a, a net gain or a loss of FTE across the district? What are we looking at for FTEs? Is it going to be constant or are we, you know, through attrition, through retirements, whatever it may be, um, where do we stand as far as um, gaining or losing overall staff? Mm -hmm. there, there's some information in your, okay. in your budget about okay. that. So um, based on where 
we are with this proposal as it currently stands, we would have an increase over the FY22 budget of three and a half um, staff members. Okay. So. Thank you, Mr. Colley. One last question um, in regards to which I, I, I agree with the um, this, uh, restructuring of the curriculum position. I would just ask uh, before we, you know, at some point before we take a vote um, on our final budget that I'd like to see uh, some type of job description as well as a salary range for these positions as well. Mm -hmm. okay. As long as you're speaking about that, one thing, uh, as soon as the committee has discussion, that I, I, I expect those positions to be, um, I expect us to have a lot of internal, very qualified people that would be applying for those positions. Sure, so I've heard. Yeah, and um, which I'm hopeful for because obviously these are people that know what we're doing and have been doing for many years in the district. With that said, then I would expect a domino effect. Mm -hmm. So it will be imperative for us to get those postings up sooner than later. And as far as the budget, pro so it's almost like it would have to be even an anticipated posting without even final approval with the town, et cetera, because that will be way too late to get those postings. So what are, what are you thinking for a timeline, Dr. Given, as far as, post, <laughs> as far as getting the postings up, which I fully yeah. agree with, yeah. at least myself. Yeah. Um, I, would, I would like to do them like after, right after vacation, to be honest. So okay. think about that. Because, yeah, I, you know, I, I would. I mean, posting and then starting the process can still have time, we'll still have time to take place and, and we'll be going through the budget process. But to be able to get folks um, interested and, and applying and then I, I just would like to get that done sooner than later. Sure. No, I completely yeah. understand. I'm just speaking yeah. for myself. I, you know, e even if you can get us some yeah, type of absolutely. draft description and yeah. what you're thinking of as a salary range for these positions yeah. as well. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mr. Chair. Nunes. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to piggyback on what Mr. Oliver was saying, I agree. I mean, personally, uh, at, at, at this point, uh, you know, get them posted, you know, with the, with the caveated, you know, approval, you know, budget yeah. approval will yeah. be required. Mm -hmm. So at least you know who's interested, who's out there, and what that domino effect is mm -hmm. type of, type of mm -hmm. deal. So that way, sure. you know, every, again, I agree with Chris, get it, mm -hmm. get it, get it started and get it going to, with regards to the budget, uh, you know, it's always disappointing to sit there and, <laughs> you know, <coughs> the wants and, and the haves and the have nots type, type of deal that, that, that take place. And then, you know, I've said, I've said this before and I'll continue to be the broken record. This is not, you know, people are not looking for the Taj Mahal here. They're, they're looking for the basics to, to keep things running in, in that. So um, it's, it's disappointing. I applaud the, the use of, uh, you know, the grants, you know, for the RVT and the, uh, the school choice monies for, you know, the after school activities and other things. You know, again, one time, you know, the, the school choice being the one time that, it, that they're being used for. So I, I have no issues with that. I will go through this. I will, you know, make an appointment with Mr. Kiley mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. with all my questions and come in and sit down and mm -hmm. kill three hours of his afternoon. <laughs> but uh, no, seriously, and, and thank you very much. You know, sorry I killed the tree, but you know. <laughs> Uh, Miss Amaral. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I tend to like paper as well, but um, I'm trying. I'm trying to be a little bit more <laughs> um, technologically savvy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's see. You know, going in the middle, at least there's some more questions that might be a little original <laughs> when you go last. That everybody's pretty much asked a lot of them. Uh, in terms of, you know, I, um, the RBT, I think this. Uh, but you know this position is is certainly um, necessary mm -hmm. um it's a it brings a skill set to kind of nuance just a again bring it into my i have a child who benefits from this type of position where that redirection at the right time in the right way uh, makes or breaks the day the week really and um you know seeing kiddos coming back to school um, and having 
you know, learning well and everything, but still kind of uncovering those struggles and, 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 and difficulties that they have that the, are most vulnerable students. Um, this position, though, is district-wide, um, and I can only imagine looking at, although different types of positions, the not funding, you know, not able to fund some interventionalists for special education, middle level, um, I think in Quinn, would this position kind of hold like a high um, um, caseload, or how are those trained TA building the credentials within our TAs going to work in terms of district-wide? Are they going to be sitting in a certain school? Are they going to be floating? Um, or do we not know yet? Yeah, we, we have folks on, on staff now that are in schools, mm -hmm. assigned to schools. Yep. But we're just seeing an increasing need, Yes. Um, as you know, um, yep. requirements on IEPs. So we're not quite sure. Um, there could be a small caseload to start, mm -hmm. but the need is definitely there. Yeah. And rather than contracting out, you know, having our own people on staff is certainly a saving. So yeah, we're not absolutely. sure. Uh, okay. And each year, cool. actually, sometimes these kind of folks might get moved. Just like an SLP, we sure. rearrange the schedules. It's stuff like that. So. Yep. 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 Um, thank you. And let's see. And I just had a question. You know, you talked about the ESSER two, the ESSER three money. Um, how does sort of our obligation with uh, SOA kind of... Uh, um, <laughs> You know, what are the implications of pre-pandemic? Pre you know, I'm all for the equity, but those the monies from that didn't come to us. Mm -hmm. We were kind of held harmless, if I remember correctly, um, the Student Opportunities Act. I do know that I see online our proposal and our plan and, and all of the, the, you know, um, the deadlines of the start dates and all of the, the requirements needed. How has that implicated the resources needed for some of really. all of the all of the above? You know, um, we've gotten no, no funding from right. it at all. <laughs> but we do have the obligation to do all the reporting and paperwork yes. and, you know. So it's um, right. It, <laughs> statewide, it's, it's great that they're spending more money on education. Yeah. I w would have liked that they spent a little bit here, yeah. but they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, were you able, though, to sort of put things that we're already doing? You know, we've got a great emphasis mm -hmm. on social emotional yes. health of our students even yes. pre-pandemic and obviously we're on, you know still yes. working through a lot of that it's yeah, very when difficult we, when we developed the plan we basically used what we were already doing just what you're saying knowing we weren't getting extra money for yeah. it but we had to continue to do the work that we're doing so. yeah okay thank you and thank you for that and and, and jim thank you i'm i know i'm going to have more questions mm -hmm. um you know I, i'll be looking through this and studying this some more, but um, thank you for your continued sort of um, ability to just break things down for us um, in terms of, yeah, all of the, the dollars. I'm, You're welcome. And thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Ms. White. Yeah, no, I just will echo again what my colleagues have said and, you know, say thank you very much. It's hard to look at these numbers at times, you know, I'm mm -hmm. not going to lie, especially those unfunded you know, requests. Um, Certainly, I've sat in school council meetings at DeMello, and every you know, and I know that when they're asking, you know, it's not, it's not to go to Disneyland for the fourth time in the year. You know, they're, they want to buy fruit at the grocery store. You know, it's that kind of thing. So I, I really feel like, um, you know, it's hard to see. Um, I'm really grateful for all the work that you've done, and I think it's significant to look and see that, you know, we're dropping our administrative costs by 14.5 percent. I mean, that's that's a, a lot of work on your end. It's a lot of restructuring. I think it's you know, I, I'm. Again, I'd like to see the breakdown of those positions. I think it's going to help us. You know, I, I have been concerned that we don't have enough, connect, you know, um, relationships aren't as strong as they need to be between our schools, you know, from a vertical curriculum standpoint. So I think it's really going to make a dramatic difference yeah, yeah. in that. So, um, so I'm excited to see that. Um, you know, and ultimately, you know, so much of this, what we can fund is not enough, and we're so dependent. And, on our parent teacher organizations yep. and our music organization. It's just a shame that they have to do as much as they do. But, you know, I'm so thankful that they, they do work so hard. I'm seeing a lot of great work happening in each of those elementary schools. I know over at the middle school, um, you know, it's it's just a lot. And so and certainly we know there's the, the music association. I mean, the amount of work that those parents put in. But it's, you know, again, it's unfortunate. And I, and I look at things like, 
text and library books, you know, just <laughs> when I think of that broken out, you know, and even our, um, you know, our online text and the same funding, mm -hmm. I know what our history books look like. I mean, it, they are incredibly dated. And it's, uh, and again, I, that those resources don't stretch that far. So again, whatever funds we get from other groups, you know, I'm very grateful, but it's, it's a shame that we are in the lowest 16 point five percentile for per people spending in the state. I think that's uh, mm -hmm. that's a that's unfortunate for and I think we get way more than that from our schools and our educators. I think we are very, very lucky for what we put in. Mm -hmm. So that will be my Thank you, Ms. Waite. Uh, Mr. Kiley, I have a couple of questions. Um, can you remind me we talked about the the student parking fee. Did we eliminate or does this budget eliminate the transcript fee? Yes, we're prepared we're to eliminate that. the transcript. Okay. Uh, that one, fee, yes. you know, yeah, okay. yeah. It's no yes. money. I already put the money out of my pocket yeah. to pay yep. for my kids. Yeah. But going through that process, it just made me realize mm -hmm. what a barrier yeah. it is yeah. to some kids. Okay. So I would really like to see that fee yeah. right. go away. So this budget did not eliminate the parking the, the student right. parking right. fee, though. I, I get that, I, yep. and uh, I can live with that. But I really do want us to get rid of that transcript mm -hmm. yep. fee because it is an ac yep. access and equity mm -hmm. um, <laughs> issue. Um, the second one, I want to go back to uh, Mr. Oliver's points about ESSER, and you know, I've mentioned this before that I have concerns about our, um, these are all needed positions, but we're going to fall off a fiscal cliff. And also, it's, it's, we've got some recurring funding going on here, so I would like to see at some point some sort of report about how we're spending and where we are. Um, because I think, you know, down the road in a little bit, whoever's in these chairs and this and this table are going to be have to go out and make the case for that funding those needs are not going to go away those positions um, we're going to have to do so i think we have to from the start be very careful about tracking what we're spending and the impact of that spending whether it be you know if we're hiring a social worker how many visits are they doing what are they doing if we're hiring um, you know a behavior th how many students are they serving so that we can really make the case about the need when it when it comes that time I will also say I have some concerns about, and this is just my thing, about the use of school choice. And I think that perhaps it's time for us as a committee to have a discussion about school choice. We have treated it as one-time expense. At the same point in time, it's been, I don't know, five or six years now that we've had school choice. Um, our budget is tight. I mean, this is using being used to combat inflationary costs, but I don't think prices are going to roll back anytime soon. So that's like there. So if we're going to use school choice funding for recurring expenses, I think we as a committee should develop some sort of policy. So 62,000, I'm not particularly concerned. I mean, the balance in school choice now is Million considerable yeah. right but we I think at some point maybe we should have a discussion that if we're going to put school choice on recurring spending on school choice we need to have an X balance it can't yeah. be more than X percent of the balance that way if it if we do vote in one year right to get rid of school choice then we have several years of reserve fund to sort of back that out um, so I think it's worth us sort of developing some sort of a potentially a policy around that and we don't obviously not tonight <laughs> but I think um, I'd like for us to have some sort of discussion about that if we are going to use that money for recurring revenues well I think two things you did put in place a ten thousand dollar limit if you recall that right you did put yep. that in place so if we would like you have to come to you have to come yeah. to us for more than ten thousand and then we did um, something what I think you're talking about we talked about the TA position because that is a recurring um, correct so we did bring that so those are the kinds of things yeah and I just, other than that like a two thousand dollar stipend or something I can't imagine you know that's that's but, fine right. I just I mean my concern is that if we start building up yeah. what we're we got hundred fifty thousand dollars in school choice in a recurring budget and then next year we yeah. it votes to go away we got to figure out how to make that up right we, we have, have some a time. balance that time. can help us get there right, right to right. ease us off right um, but I think we need to think about sort of yep. what our fiscal policy is going to be around that if we're going mm -hmm. to build that into the budget. Yep. Um, yep. So I don't have a problem with using the 62,000, but I want us to sort of think carefully about how we're going to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. 
Um, and so those are, those are, I think, my only sort of uh, questions or concerns at this point in time. <coughs> okay. Anyone else? Yeah, Mr. Nunes. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I wasn't going to mention this because town hall gets upset when I do, yeah. but uh, <laughs> Mrs. Waite brought it up, you know, with funding and everything else and did some quick math tonight. And, you know, if we were at the, uh, the state average of... Uh, 17.5 we'd have another 9.5 million in our budget so we wouldn't have to sit here and no disrespect have all these one of we could we would have the Taj Mahal yes. and I'm being facetious here but understand what I'm saying you know we, we would have been able to fund the other you know seven hundred thousand dollars and mm. things of that nature I mean no disrespect and thank you to our state fathers a hundred thousand they're not doing you know nobody's doing us any favors up up in Boston right now with with our budget and the numbers they're getting if you look at the cherry sheet with what's going on with other communities and more so they've gone with the gateway communities you know the new benefits and the fall you know their chapter 70 and other uh, have gone through the roof type of deal and you know we're uh, we're looking for for nickels and dimes and they're getting hundred dollar bills mm -hmm. so uh, it's tough yeah. yeah I'd also follow up and say though that it's not just on our state representation it's on us right i mean our tax rate is really low and so the state looks at us and says you can afford to do more i mean that's what it comes down to at the soa oh, yeah. you can afford to do more and so we don't get more because we're not we're not giving effort oh, yeah. um you know i would love to i agree mr Jones, i'd love to just be at the average right it would give us so much more um room but we're not um and you know maybe we'll get closer but that's going to have to be on us to if we want to make that progress oh yeah all right, any other questions or comments? Yep. All right, so we'll come back to the budget at our next meeting, and then the meeting after that is the mm -hmm. public hearing on the budget. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. All right, um, so next we have old business. We have a student representation to the school committee. Um, Ms. Waite uh, sent a document to me. Ms. Genther passed that, circulated to you late. It's just a start. We're continuing yep. this discussion, but I thought I'd let um, Ms. Waite talk a little bit about sort of what she's been working on and we can come back to it. Sure, so I met on Tuesday with uh, Mr. Thibault um, at the high school and kind of went over like his thoughts. Um, he had also looked at the documents that uh, Dr. Jenkins had shared as well. Just to kind of start lining this up, um, we looked at Milton has a pretty solid policy, um, but again, like making some adjustments. So, you know, after that conversation, I wrote out some of his thoughts, um, you know, if you want to take it you know some time to read this you know think about it and we can you know certainly circle back to it um, but one of his you know when I talked to Ross he really felt strongly that we should while there are five members that are mandated by the state he definitely felt that we should include a freshman I think um, Milton only does sophomores juniors and seniors he was of the opinion that when we look at freshmen they have certainly very unique needs concerns coming into the school um, so he wanted to see them represented so you know just you know trying as we sat down we talked about what that representation would look like again we were leaning towards having two seniors um, who would be elected as juniors so that election would take place within the current freshman sophomore and junior class prior to june so in theory when they're electing other officers is what he was thinking and then the freshmen when they came in they would be elected at the same time that they're also doing their other officers. So he felt like that was a pretty seamless process. He also, um, as we talked further, you know, it became clear as he kind of anticipated how it would look in the school. Um, he thought the initial plan, I think Milton might have had that group meeting by themselves every other week. He said at some point it becomes just like meeting to have meetings. So he really thought a monthly meeting, plus then they are meeting with our body. And again, adjusting the timing to trying to avoid you know, large vacation months. Um, we thought September, November, um, coming back in January, March, and then finishing off in May. Um, you know, and again, like other you know, details, you know, I listed there some of the, and this comes back, I also referenced the Boston Public Schools as well and some of what they do, because again, we don't have models everywhere, but um, you know, in the Boston Public Schools, you know, they pretty well articulated some of the responsibilities. Of course, they're coming from multiple buildings in this case so i consolidated those ideas for what the students would be doing for us you know but really they're representing their classmates on policy issues when they they come here so 
you know, in distinguishing that from those students who would be at student council, he did think it would be helpful to possibly have, um, I believe it's Ms. McCarran Dealey, who is the, is that, um, who is the advisor for student council, she, or, stu, or um, student, what am I trying to say, student, is student council, is that, mm -hmm. yeah, student council, so, yep. he, council. yeah, so he actually thought it would be nice, it would be helpful if she's willing to take it on and, you know, talking about a stipend, if she would take on the role of advisor of this group as well so that she can, you know, she'll know what's discussed within the student council. And again, to kind of art, you know, articulate, this is more policy, which would be more appropriate for the student advisory committee. So again, so we kind of talked about some of those different, you know, um, ideas and you know, trying to convert them into a policy. So, but again, we can you know, certainly circle back to this. I don't know if it's appropriate to send it over to the policy committee. Um, again, you know, I would anticipate that this would need to take place <coughs> in there at the same time as our normal elections, and then we would get that group on board starting in the summer. Um, and part of that too is that we talked about the uh, the regional committee, which was something that I'm actually haven't been that familiar with. Um, that we actually have a regional representative to the school, you know, from our school um, to the committee. So I, I believe Josh Moniz mm -hmm. has that role. So I thought that was interesting. So perhaps our chairperson could be um, of this student advisory committee could then be the representative to that committee. So that was, and then could circle back and tell us some of the happenings within the regional committee mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And again, extend that performance. And they offer some training. So I did put down at the bottom that you know, we could consider training as being, um, you know, not compulsory in the summer, but they could take advantage of that leadership training, and I think it would be great for them, and that could be part of the meetings as well. So, again, just, I know it's a lot to read, it's pretty lengthy, but just as uh, an overview, and then, you know, we can go from there. Thank you. So I know this uh, circulated late, so people yes. probably um, haven't had time to read it yet. Um, you know, I, I skimmed it, I think it looks good. Mm. Um, I just wanted Miss Wade to a chance to explain it to everyone. Um, and we can we can bring it back up, um, Dr. Gifford. I do have a question for you, though. Um, does this need to go through the policy subcommittee or no? It's it's up. It depends on how you want to take it. I mean, this if you wanted to do a little policy that the committee would have this body, and then this all becomes the practice behind it. Right. Or it depends if you really think you need a policy in place because it. I guess I've, you know. I've, when, yeah, when I just, we talked about yeah. this, this is like, what is it, J-I-I-B or yeah. something? It's actually there. there. I actual actually listed in the, the, so the first page is actually state law, and I just lost my screen. Yes, so right, but there that. is, there most is. of the school districts list that first part, um, or a small part, so as, a an, small part. as an right, actual right, right. policy, yeah. Yeah. And, and then the spend. bulk of that stuff is all is, procedure. Right. Yes, it's not a, an official policy. Right. So I don't know, do we have, a, I think it's, I want to say it's J-I-I-B. J-I-B-B. J-I-B-B, mm -hmm. Thank close. You. Thank you. Thank you. Well, when you. Do we have that already on I record? I, I mean, I guess I the, if yeah. we have it on record yeah, already, then it probably has to go through the policy co subcommittee because we're talking right. about changing an, an official policy, right? Um, and then we, as a committee, yeah, we'll go through the regular process yeah. of voting on that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And and I did have a question as I was kind of digging through this, and may, and uh, maybe Dr. Gifford, you know, you can answer this. Do we have? I it was under my impression that I was reading through this state literature that it seemed as though we we're supposed to send two representatives to the regional school committee. Is that? But it, when I spoke with Ross, it was. You know, he's mentioned that we have um, Josh Moniz. So mm -hmm. do we have two? Yeah, that's yeah. that's what I, I mean, this was all kind of, I mean, I would love to hear from him and have him come in. Right. I just, um, I think, you know, honestly, he should be thanked for, you know, carrying out this position, but I would like to hear more about it as well. So, yeah. and, um, but I just was curious, because again, I was looking at the state policy and it does seem that we're required to have those two. So, you know, hopefully we, uh, again, held harmless with everything else that's going on. <laughs> I don't think it's too, uh, <laughs> Critical, but I just uh, it was just something I picked up on as it was going through. Yeah, I'm on the the DOA site, and it says the SSA, the State Student Advisory Council, is composed of five regional councils. According right. to state mandate, every secondary school must elect must is in bold. That's why I said it like yeah. that. It's in bold, <laughs> must elect two delegates to a regional SAC. Well, that's what I just caught up on too, right before I sat down with uh, Ross, and I was yeah. like, oh, 
So, you know, and again, I wasn't even aware that Josh was a, uh, a representative to that group. So I think it's really, it's important, I think, for us to sure. hear their work because actually they then, those students meeting together, elect a sitting and voting member to the state, um, yeah. you know, yeah. board as well. So I think council. that that's a, you know, I, you know, it's not only is it a great experience for the students who mm. go there, but I think um, we should hear from them. So. All right, so can we, do we want to refer this to the policy subcommittee? Is that the pleasure of the committee? Or do we so want where to does this stand right now? It, do we have a policy on the books? We have a student involvement in decision-making policy. It's very small. It might need, need a little adjustment, but maybe not. So we'll take a look at this, and then if we yeah. if it doesn't include yeah. what we're yeah. doing, we can certainly uh, bring so, it So it we'll the have the policy, policy subcommittee look at that policy, yep. and then we as a committee can discuss the procedures yep, that are behind it. Might it. Be okay. And I'm on that policy okay. as well, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Ms. So we'll see. Too, so. yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, excellent. Um, the next item on the agenda is um, school, uh, school committee policy EBCFA, the face coverings policy. Um, as you all know, um, on this committee, this board, um, the policy when enacted, um, the last line of the policy is the policy will remain in place until rescinded by the school committee, um, which is why this is on yep. the agenda this evening. Um, for a vote. So I will open it up for discussion, motions, um, anything from my committee members. That was me, sorry. I was moving oh. it out of the way. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. Who's <laughs> working with? Uh, Mr. Oliver. So I, I guess I'll start, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the uh, audience members that are in here uh, that shared their th thoughts and views as well. Um, so I, I'm in agreement that it, it's time for us to um, to drop the uh, the face um, face mask mandate um, as per the governor. Um, uh, you know I think it's it's time we're at a point which we can um, start to move forward and not look behind us. Um, just just a couple of points. Uh, one being as I I don't know if any of you had the chance to look at the MASC guidance that they emailed us today. Yep. Yep. Um, just making sure that um, if we were to drop the ban, that stu according to this, uh, the policy would still state students and staff returning from five-day quarantine following a positive COVID test must follow strict mask use for the next five mm -hmm. days mm -hmm. uh, other than eating, drinking, or outside. So I'm not sure, um, you know, as far as uh, what we should do with that, just making sure that the district's following up with mm -hmm. that. Um, the other thing which I just I didn't know that I did not know this until I just read it was uh, mass will be required in all school health offices how is the district handling that um, and the other thing that I have and obviously it's a federal uh, regulation mm. with busing right right um, it's, it's still that's at the federal level with transportation I guess my question is with the um and i guess i have a few of them with the um the the classrooms and all that and with the buildings uh, would we continue would what's the plan from the school district from the administration as far as right now we're in pods i believe we're potting students mm -hmm. will potting stay in place for for the um uh, at least for the next couple of weeks so are we going back uh, cafeterias um, so if you could just share a little bit about like the, the procedures that have we, we've put in place. Is it just going completely, you know, right back to normal? Sure. Um, well, I actually met with the elementary admin team today and um, we decided, you, you have to remember that some of these things that are put in place, then we have the resulting contact tracing. So the potting, why we did the pods was to make it easier for contact tracing and prevent that. So that's gone away. Right. So mm -hmm. there really is no sense in maintaining a pod. Mm -hmm. it, to be honest there's no sense so what we discussed today was the only thing we wanted to keep just as is for now is just the structure of the lunchrooms with the mm -hmm. desks the kids can talk uh, before you know now we've been keeping them kind of quiet they've been showing movies etc but let them talk and function normally but just not get rid of that little bit of a distance right now I mean you've all seen it with the just the desk mm -hmm. and only because one of the things is it's kind of um, almost impossible to hurry up and move everything between now and sure. next week. So just to kind of slowly get back into that. Um, the middle school I know is doing the same thing. They're just slowly evolving back into the, into the lunchroom. You have to think too, some of these kiddos haven't even been in there in mm -hmm. two years. Right. The way they've been 
um, separated. But um, they, they really want to focus on creating as much normalcy as possible, get rid of the pods, um, all of that. And um, to your point, Mr. Kiley's made sure that we have enough masks for the nurse's office. That's because of the DPH, the, any medical area, you right. have to have a mask, just to make sure when kids go in or whatever that they have one, cause the, and getting on the bus as well. So we're hopefully uh, be able to uh, keep that in place for now. I didn't know, Mr. Kiley just told me March 18th, perhaps the bus uh, restriction goes away. Perhaps. Well, yeah, Perhaps. It, it, it's at the at the current time it's through March 18th. Yeah. Now so they we'll could see. they could revisit it. I don't know, we'll but see. it's the CDC and the TSA. Yeah. And so okay, we'll, we'll see what happens yeah. with that. But. Thank yeah. you, uh, thank you for your comments. So last but not least, my. I'll just leave the committee with, uh, with this, that uh, I, I'm fully in support of dropping the mandate. Um, you know, my only thing is we're doing it right after school vacation. I've had several people, several families uh, reach out to me. That I also had a family. I think we all got that uh, mother reach out to us about, you know, um, putting on a survey to solicit feedback from all the um, stakeholders, uh, the families. Um, she had some concern, I guess. Uh, I don't know if she works for Old Rochester Regional, but someone, uh, someone in her family uh, was there and she thought that was very, um, you know, uh, she welcomed that um, to still get a, a gauge from the families. Um, so, you know, it's neither here nor there. That's something we, we didn't do, you know, maybe we should have, uh, but at the end of the day, um, we didn't. And um, I'll just say, you know, I, my only concern is dropping it the day after, um, returning from February break and do we do we leave it in place for another five days other than that I'm in support of it of dropping it Mr. Nunes yeah, thank you madam chair a uh, couple of questions I have for, for the superintendent uh, with this coming up on uh, September 28th what does this do for like visitors coming to school spectators at uh, you know athletic events music things coming up you know band competitions and we've got you know a band competition coming up uh, the 19th of march nesba finals you know the beginning of april what does that do for spectators and and, th and the like coming here it just allows them to come in even now with athletics like for example at the um the ice arena yeah. there's no mandate there it's not our property so we we've strongly encouraged yeah. So with that said, with the mandate being dropped, we, we won't require it. One thing we did talk about this morning was we're just going to hold off on um, uh, visitors, per se, to our elementary schools. Like, we've really held off on that as far as presentations and things. Yeah. But we thought we'll just hold off a little bit as the warmer weather starts to come in and windows are open and we can be a little bit more outside. Um, so, but to your point, um, really... The mandate would be gone at that point. And the other one, Mr. Oliver, has mm. questioned on lunches, so that'll take care yep. of that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with, you know, this policy, mm -hmm. you know, going, going away. One of the things that I, you know, struggled with but think that we need to do is, you know, put, you know, I know we're going to have to make a motion to uh, amend this policy to make it go to rescind this to policy. But what I'd like to see happen is that uh, there be a caveat on it uh, that if, you know, if, if, you know, God forbid this blows up again with whatever, whether it be the COVID or another variant or, or something of that nature, and between federal, state, and local authorities, uh, they come up with, you know, uh, they come back with the mask mandate that the superintendent be allowed to implement it ASAP mm -hmm. without coming back to this committee because it could happen tomorrow and we're not meeting for three weeks right. type of deal. So we end up between a rock and a hot, they end up between a rock and a hot place. So that would allow mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the administration to, to implement that policy back. So other than that, that's if all the, I have. If the state implements a mass mandate, we have to comply with the mass well, mandate. Well, I understand right? that, but I'm, I'm, not, just I'm not sure uh, Dr. Gifford wants to get out over her skis without <laughs> us um, <laughs> on a mass mandate if the state doesn't implement it, but we can talk about that. We can, right? Yeah, fine. That's all I have. Ms. Amaral. Yeah, um, 
yeah, I, this, to me this is like a formality. So, um, you know, we talk about the numbers going down. Um, I think of this body, I think I was the last to be vaccinated because I was worried about implications. And my son has medically complex and I was worried about, you know, reactions with him. And, uh, you know, and, and all has been well, uh, barring a couple of scares here and there. Um, and, you know, you talk about social emotional well-being. I know my daughter is very, um, you know, is active in softball and, and sports and she, She's a black belt in Taekwondo. She's wearing a mask, you know, she's complying or, or not outside and in basketball they didn't have, whatever. Um, and I know she has some worries, so, you know, of, of, of her brother who goes to mm -hmm. hockey games, wears his mask mm -hmm. down below his nose sometimes, but he manages mm -hmm. well because he knows it means it's access to, to, you know, over the last few years he knows, he knew enough that it was meant access to fun stuff for him. But, um, you know, students like her are probably going to be a little bit more concerned about um, the well-being of, you know, some kiddos just might, they're going to have to get used to this. And so mm. I think if we're just gentle and kind and, and um, I, I try not to, but I read social media and it's like, oh, you're talking about me and I'm right here, but uh. that didn't happen. <laughs> but um, you know, there had been some comments that I was reassured to see some comments around parents who might have used the disparaging phrase around what this is, now saying, well, we're going to teach our kids to go to school and be kind to those students. Uh, my daughter, I, I asked her, she's in the middle school, she can make some decisions, some, uh, and she's very mature, and I asked her, she is going to be, um, uh, she decided she wants to wear her mask the first few days or mm -hmm. first week after mm -hmm. February vacation good for her mm -hmm. um, and and maybe she'll change her mind by that time um, but as long as I think we're concerned I did I think Chris and I I, I don't know received a few just to us emails yeah, I, I noticed and maybe I others no, oh, I yeah either. I don't ever get them from the town side no. FYI I just get them to you know through the school department website but so I wonder if I miss some sometimes but um, you know there are family you know parents that are concerned and there are parents who have a strong opinion on it one way or the other, but all that to say, I think as long as we're kind and compassionate mm -hmm. and understanding and, and make it not a big deal whether a student, right. you know, and nip anything in the bud where you might hear a student kind of reiterating something they heard from somebody or a comment from a particular opinion one way or the other, whether a student is or isn't wearing a mask, um, it's, we have to give each other grace again and just um, kind of let that kind of play out, but with, um, you know, compassion and understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how we're gonna get through this. So, I mean, I, again, this is a formality to me. I was like, what, what's the hubbub? But, you know, uh, but here we are and, you know, we made the policies, so we have to get rid of it, you know, if we so choose, mm -hmm. so that's it. <laughs> Miss Waite. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I think it's time. You know, I'll just, you know, I, I I do have this share Mr. Oliver's concern then, and it probably will happen. We will have a bump when we come back from vacation. I mean, that's going, I anticipate that will happen. Um, I know that my daughter has already said she's going to wear it through the hallways because she feels less comfortable in the classroom. She may not, you know. So, again, but I, I do appreciate the sense of, you know, we've come to this, we're the kind of the last group still wearing masks, which again, which again, I think we're at that moment if things change. I think we, you know, from the state, we need to reassess. But um, I think we do, I, I do believe that, you know, certainly they've gotten us through the, a lot of the worst effects of the pandemic. And it's why the students, you know, haven't gotten ill is because of the safeguards from school is because of safeguards that we've had in place. I think it's happened from sleepovers and things like that that have been happening outside yes. of school. So I am, you know, I have to say that I'm, happy with our policy, I think it was good. I think it's time now for us to kind of move on, you know, and you know, we want our little, you know, youngest learners to be able to see their teachers' faces and each other's faces and, you know, with language. I mean, there are certain concerns, so. Absolutely. Okay. So that's, so I, I vote to uh, rescind it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm also inclined to, to remove the mask mandate, but I do have a, a few questions. Um, you know, I, I talked to our, our campus, uh, you know, virologist um, about this question. Look to him for guidance because, I mean, he's been consulting 
for businesses, movies, schools, every you name it, he's been doing that. And you know, his his sense and my sense too is is it's time to remove the mask, but not because we're not in a pandemic anymore. I mean, I just looked up our 14 day positivity rate in Dartmouth is 12.99%. Our vaccination rate is 65.7%, right? So I don't, I'm, not, I'm not willing to make the argument that we're out of the pandemic right. yet, we're still in it. But we do know that kids are far less willi- likely to get sick, right? And so um, there are benefits to removing masks. But, um, so a couple of questions. One of the things he suggested to me is that there is there are questions about sort of access to high quality masks um, one of our speakers noted right that the cloth masks they don't really work right um, for those people who might want high quality masks particularly children's masks can 95s but do not have access to them um, would we again this i'm not saying that everyone has to get a kn95 mask but if you feel uncomfortable from mas- unmasking and you want a quality mask, would there be some way for us, for the children, um, to provide access to them through our suppliers? We don't have any youth size KN95s. Okay, it's something I think I might like us to consider to see if we can do. I'm not sure, I'm not sure there'd be a huge run on them, but for someone who, um, you know, might be low income, might have immunocompromised people, family at home, this does represent an increased risk to them in coming to school when more people are unmasked. And so I'd like for us for, through for equity and access sort of, you know, thinking to be able to provide some of those students if they can't have them with the sorts of things that will keep themselves and their families safe. Um, so I'd like to just, just potentially think about that. Um, I also, I understand the, the um, keeping the lunchroom sort of as they are now. Um, if there's anywhere that I'd like to see us kind of try to move back to normal, it's in the high school. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I know my son is a senior. He's gone through many of the similar challenges um, that some one of our speakers talked about. Um, we have had some severe mental health crises in our mm-hmm. house as well. Um, and so they only have, the, the seniors, right, they only have three or four months mm-hmm. left. Um, lunch is often the best part of the day, <laughs> I, you know, for some of these kids, let's just put it that way. And so I'd like to see if we can prioritize if it's taking personnel that we try to figure that out here in the high school because those kids I think have the have the least amount of time left here in, in these schools. Mm-hmm. And then okay. no, you're not just, taking comments yeah. from the audience at this point in time. I am simply saying that as we prioritize the personnel to make our lunchrooms back to normal, I would like to start with the high school. Finally, I will just reiterate what Mr. Noon said, that we are removing the masks now. This is no guarantee that masks will not be needed again. And the best way for us to make sure that we don't need them again is for all of us to be vaccinated. That having been said, I will entertain a motion from a member of my committee if anyone would like to rescind policy EBCFA, or if there's any further discussion, I will entertain questions or comments. Mr. Noons, you have your hand up. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion that we rescind policy EBCFA that we accepted on uh, August of 2020 with the caveat that if the virus should uh, start up again and between federal, state, and local authorities. They put a mask mandate back in place that the superintendent is authorized to uh, implement said mask mandate under this policy. A second. Discussion on the motion. I'm just gonna say I'd like to ask Dr. Gifford. Mm -hmm. I am in favor of rescinding policy EBCFA, I think we ought to rescind the motion. Mm -hmm. Do you want the power to implement a mass mandate without the authorization of the school committee? We as a committee are giving up our power to the superintendent. Um, This is not about the rescinding of the mass mandate. To me, this is about us giving up our authority. I'd like to ask Dr. I mean, I'd like your opinion I whether just, you would like that or not. I just think Mr. Noons is getting at the point that if it was a real emergency, like yeah. right. if there was yeah. something trending, yeah. you know, we have meetings in between. Yeah. So like a real emergency, I would certainly want to do that if, if need be. I, hopefully it doesn't happen. Yeah. But it's just we have the meetings so spread out sometimes that it's yeah. hard to. We also always, have the ability to call an emergency meeting. Yeah. 
Mr. Nunes, you have a comment? No, I was just going to say the, exactly what Dr. Gifford said, and that is, you know, we're not meeting for three weeks. I mean, and for discussion purposes, you know, maybe not March 1st, but March 2nd is, you know, everything blows up and they put this back in place. We're not meeting, well, we meet the following Monday, but understand what I'm saying. In between times, the superintendent has, has the ability. She's going to bring it back to us. Yeah, right. Okay, it's coming back to us the following meeting. To, reinst to reinstate it, but the, and we're just going to ratify what, what the, she's that's doing. That's not what this says. No, this I says know, she but you has know the authority what, to do it. So we're you know what's going to happen, Shannon. Her. You know this she's going to do that. Well, if it's a state mandate, aren't isn't she compelled anyway? Mm -hmm. so, right, but this gives so her this the authority to do it on her own without a state mandate. Okay. Well, fine. Well, I don't need it. No, I mean I this. I, I'm just. This is the motion <laughs> on the table, and here's what I would say. I, I will it. vote for a clean motion to rescind. The, the school mandate. Policy. If the governor implements a mass mandate, we are compelled to follow it. What's on the table before us now is a motion when the, in the absence of a state mandate no. to authorize, yes. No, I said, and federal, state, and local authorities put the mask mandate back in. So isn't it a, We don't need it. Isn't it a moot point okay. if, if the state local or federal authorities are putting a mask mandate in place isn't it a moot point that it you know about the school committee local uh, intervening because the way i'm reading this dr jenkins is that it's only if there's a a mandate put in place by riley and we don't need that well that's what i mean exactly we don't, we don't need the language Fine, I'm Ms. I, mean, I, I think you're sort of responding to the fact that it was always very gray for many, for many, many, many months throughout all this, sort of leaving the municipalities and the state and the mm. Commonwealth to sort of fend for themselves in a way to make the best decisions. So I think that's what you're leaning toward. Like if we had something written just in case they were so mm. vague as to say, do it. I didn't say do it. You know, I mean, yeah. that's sort of what they've been doing this whole time. Let's yeah. be real. Is that sort of what you're, you just wanted something clear so that we don't be stuck, we're stuck sort of in a predicament where we have to call it, there's a meeting and all I'm, make a all I'm, all I'm saying is, <laughs> is if it hits the fan, okay, <laughs> let, let's, let's put the cards on the table. If it hits the fan, okay, the superintendent has the authority <clears throat> to put the masks back in, okay? You know for a fact We've all been around long enough, no disrespect to Mary, mm -hmm. at least I've been around long enough. <laughs> when something pops up, you know, the superintendent makes a decision. It comes back to us at the next meeting and says, here's what I had, here's what's had to have been done, period. You don't want, I'll rescind my amendment, okay? I'll keep my motion to rescind the, the policy and I'll rescind but I will rescind <laughs> my motion. Okay. So are you rescinding the entire motion or just the amendment? Just the amendment. Okay. The I appreciate Act. that very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nance. Whoever said we could disagree, but also work, we also all work, end up working together. Yes, we do. It's like the war so powers Any Act. other discussion on Mr. Noon's motion? Did we have a second? We did. Yeah. I did. Okay, Ms. Wade, I just want to make sure. Motion by Mr. Noon's, a second by Ms. Wade. Is this is Ms. Gunther all set? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I just wanted to. All set? Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we got the motion, the second, and we. Okay. We're, and I just want to make sure that she's all set. Yeah. <laughs> so the motion is to repeal school committee policy EBCFA on face coverings. Yep. Any further discussion? Nope. nope. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries unanimously. Moving on to new business. Dr. Gifford, okay. superintendent's update. A couple of things. You already heard about the SAIL program. Uh, we have the Vacation Math Academy ready to go. Grades three through 10, we already have 76 students signed up. And we're, well, Desi's really strict on the attendance, so we're trying to squinch okay. a couple of waiting list kids in. Okay. Um, I just want you to know that the naming of the basketball court is will be in process. Um, oh, nice. Andy Christofuli uh, took over that for us, so he's working with um, things like maybe painting the floor, et cetera, and, and it looks like probably early in the new season it will go forward to give us time to prepare the, the gym. So, but that's in pro I didn't want you to think we forgot about it. 
Uh, we're beginning work uh, to review and update our uh, emergency management plan. And once again, it was kind of COVID put everything on hold. I'm like, hmm, we have to make some adjustments to that. So we're working on that as well. And we're also planning for another phase of team chair training for the district for folks that uh, facilitate the, the uh, teams because we have some new folks on board. Plus, we need to review for people that have been doing it for a while to make sure that we abide by all the legal restrictions, et cetera. Um, part of school, you heard a lot about them. The only other thing I wanted to mention for them that uh, they collected soup for Super Bowl Sunday last week to, for, uh, to bring cans of soup to the Council on Aging. So that was another nice thing that they did. And they also also received, I think I mentioned last time, 5,000, but it seems a total of 6,500 from the Feinstein group. And uh, the uh, high school admin teams attended the ed camp this past weekend. And um, that is, let's see, they've been doing it for three years now. And each year, it's, it was nice that they gave up their time to do that. And they focus on social emotional learning, uh, engaging new teachers, et cetera, and project-based learning and other things. So that was nice. And also the AESA conference starts Wednesday. So I'll be going to that. And a couple of keynote speakers, speakers it's actually in person, finally, again. Uh, Michael Cardona, who's the US Secretary of Education and um, a couple of other folks that you may or may not know. So other than that, also on our COVID numbers, we I only had six as of today from last week. So it's, yeah. it's going down and down. So it. that's it. Yay. Travel. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I don't have anything. So I'll see if anyone else on the committee has any other items you may not have considered. Ms. Amaral. Only because it's in front of me that the mm -hmm. hockey team won. Oh, four good. to three. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's All exciting. Uh, anyone else, Mr. Nunes? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, good luck to our uh, sports teams that are going into their uh, winter tournaments coming up. Um, I did manage to catch uh, the tail end, I mean, literally probably <laughs> the last five minutes or so of the uh, last vocational school committee meeting that they oh. had. And, you know, Mr. Watson, they talked about being here. And, and such and hmm. it was I was able to hear better <laughs> and, and that, in, in all seriousness That's great. and uh, you know they did they did mention that they were going to be you know working on that and seeing what the problem was oh, and good. that type of deal so they so, listened you know, well listen they listened and, and they mentioned it so we'll see, we'll see what happens but I did uh, I did see that so I did want to say thank you to, to vote for do for doing that um, with regards to the uh, the, the, the music department, uh, March 4th, which is a Friday night, is going to be our annual uh, Pops concert. Uh, finally going to be able to get back to that after a two-year hiatus. Nice. Oh, uh, right. And uh, we're going to be honoring Mr. Kingsland, who oh, uh, right. we we're gonna, nice. actually going to honor when the night before <laughs> everything got shut down so, oh, <laughs> almost right. two years wow. ago. That's right. well. So uh, we are going to... Finally, be able to uh, to honor BK. So it should be a should be an interesting evening, and uh, our home indoor show that we normally have uh, February vacation is not going to happen. It's happening on uh, Saturday, March 19th, uh, starting somewhere around 12 o'clock, and with both uh, color guide and then percussion. Uh, I don't have the times yet, but. There'll be two sets of awards for uh, one for color guide, one for uh, percussion. Of course, the percussion will be you know 8:30, 9 o'clock, just for discussion purposes. I don't know about the color guide yet. I don't have those times, but uh, I will be looking. I'll be sending out an email to uh, look for uh, trophy presenters. What was, the date? what was that date again? The, the 19th. Oh, I enjoy which, that. The 19th, which is a Saturday. Of what? February? Saturday of March. Of March, March 19th. I might mm -hmm. be able so. to go. Oh. If nobody else offers, yeah, I no, that's fine. So I would offer, but I'll be the parent. I'll be the parent, so she can have. It's always fun. <laughs> it's fun. It's so, fun. Yeah. You get a chance to sit. I mean, we've got our, uh, our JV color guide. <coughs> we've got our varsity color guide who so took uh, started out this past weekend. They started up in uh, Salem at uh, one of the WGI regionals with a second place. So, oh, well, so wow. for Excellent. the first time performing in front of an live audience oh, wow. in two years. Right. Uh, they did what they did quite well, so I'm glad glad for them. 
That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, Ms. Wait and then Mr. Oliver. Okay. I just um, just kind of circle back to what I had mentioned when I was going over the, uh, the student representative report and I put it in an original email to Dr. Gifford is, you know, I because I didn't know that Josh had this, you know, um, position, I think it'd be great. I'd really like to invite him in if we can and hear from him um, and hear if we can a little bit about like that role. Um, and with that, I think we have a number of students who, and, you know, I, I imagine that, you know, Dr. Gifford and, and Mr. Tebow know a little bit more that are representing Dartmouth and, you know, on regional and state committees, you know, and so I, I'm kind of curious to hear, like, mm -hmm. who they are. I mean, I don't know, again, if it's, you know, if we have a little build-in time and a meeting, I mean, that's a little mm -hmm. different, but I just, I'm curious, I know this project, I think it's 351, 351. or 51, mm -hmm. you know, so there's a number of those students who are out there who we just don't, you know, again, they are chosen to represent us, and it'd be nice to hear a little bit about what they're doing in the, you know, extended community for uh, Dartmouth, so mm -hmm. just, a, just a thought. Sure. It's kind of a nice, fun, happy mm -hmm. thing, too. Mr. Oliver. Thank you. I was just curious, um, Dr. Jenkins, if you had made any headway for the March 8th. I had uh, actually, Dr. Gifford had reached out um, mm -hmm. to the Aquina tribe, and um, we are waiting to hear back. So I'm just not sure where we're at with right. that. I have had confirmation. I sent names today to Ms. Genther from the uh, Pocasset Wampanoag and the uh, Mashpee Wampanoag. Um, are going to attend um, the National Congress mm -hmm. of American Indians um, has not confirmed yet. They don't know, okay. um, but we do have uh, representatives from the Bocasset and the Mashpee Wampanoag for the eighth. Okay, I'll we'll have to re re-emphasize the invite because yeah. we, we didn't hear back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, input? All right, hearing none, the next regular meeting of the school committee is scheduled for Monday, March 7th uh, at 6.30 at Dartmouth High School. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Always in order. Second. All right, a motion by Noons, uh, uh, Mr. Noons. It's so late, and I haven't had any caffeine today, and a second by Ms. Amaral. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Happy Valentine's Thank you, everyone. Day, everybody. Thank you. Yes, it's a late one. That's what we needed. I knew it yeah. would be. I know.